Hi folks, this is a new experience for me. I've never been videotaped while I'm lecturing. Hopefully this, hopefully I won't look too foolish. So I'm not with you today. I'm taking my daughter to college, but I'll be back for class on Friday. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is how we measure stream discharge. This is something that you're going to learn how to do in lab next week. But the calculation that's involved with that lab is a little bit tricky. So what I'm going to do today is talk about the basis for the measurement, and I'm going to talk about how you do the calculation. I'm going to assign you a homework problem, which is your opportunity to practice doing the calculation. You'll turn that in on Monday, and I will be able to grade it, give it back to you on Wednesday of next week. And then, before you turn in your lab report, for next week's lab, you'll know whether you are doing the calculations right. The homework won't be graded, but I want you to do it and turn it in. You know, it's an opportunity for you to make sure you're doing it right before you do it as part of a lab report where you get graded on it. Uh, something I won't cover today is a lot about the mechanics and logistics of how we make the measurement in the field. That's something that we'll talk about next week uh, on Monday, because it'll be a better time to talk about that, because then you're going to the field on Tuesday and Thursday. And you won't have to remember those details from this lecture. So, when we talk about stream discharge, imagine yourself standing on the banks of a river or a stream and look across from one bank to the other. What we, you know, that's what we call a transect, an imaginary line from one bank to the other. And normally, we're, we're thinking about a line that goes perpendicular from one bank to the other bank. So it goes across the stream perpendicularly. And what flow is all about, it expresses what volume of water is passing through that transect in a given time period. So you may have heard of flow measurements being expressed in CFS. That's cubic feet per second. So when we talk about discharge, we're talking about how many cubic feet pass through that transect every second. The U.S. Geological Survey, which is the federal agency that has been charged with responsibility for tracking flow in streams and rivers throughout the United States, they report those numbers in cubic feet per second. But in other places in the literature, you'll see cubic meters per second or you know, per other time period used as well. So you know, imagine that this is a stream. And these are the two banks. The water's flowing this way. And you know, kind of imagine a pseudo three-dimensional view here. This would be the water that's coming downstream. So this would be the transect. And we're talking about how many cubic feet would pass through this plane, this imaginary plane from one bank to the other per second. The equation for this is really simple. It's just this. So that's very promising. This isn't necessarily complicated because we have a simple equation. This is discharge. This is the velocity of the water. And this is the, what we call the cross-sectional area at the transect. So it would be the area of this shape right here. That's what's represented by A. So are you zooming in enough on this that they'll be able to see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So this looks pretty simple. The thing is, uh, I, well, there are some complications. Let's think about this part. Of it. Think for a minute about how you might measure the area there. You know, we have measuring tapes. We have yardsticks, and we have surveying equipment, that kind of thing. 
those are the kind of tools that we use to go out and figure out what this area is. So that's not impossible. We can do that. It's especially feasible in streams that are shallow enough that we can wade through them. So you can imagine that. That's not too, too difficult. Now for velocity, we'll think about how are we going to measure the velocity of the water going through there. We actually have devices that are velocity meters. We put them in the water and we get a readout that tells us how many feet per second the water is flowing. Or you know, it could be meters per second or some other units. The problem is, and those of you that have spent a lot of time on the river, in kayaks or rafts or maybe just inner tubing or something like that, you know that the velocity of the water isn't necessarily the same at every location from one bank to the other. Sometimes you might be in an eddy off to the side where the water seems like it's pretty much not going anywhere. Other times you might be farther out from the side and the water is moving pretty fast. So we do have some variation from one bank to the other. All these different locations can have a different water velocity. So that's a complication. How are we going to come up with a velocity number that's representative of that whole cross-section? That's a complication. There's a second dimension to that complication. Think about the water from the surface down to the stream bank. This is probably something that you don't necessarily have direct experience with. But there's actually considerable variation in velocity in that dimension, too. So if you look over here, this is on page 34 in the package of handouts for your lecture notes. And I realize through uh, this video, you might not be able to see those numbers very well. But if you look at this on page 34 in your handouts, you'll see it. So these are transects from a real life stream. And you see a bunch of numbers. What those represent are water velocities that were actually measured in the stream, in each case, at that location. So you know, there were two locations here in the shallow area, more locations in the deeper parts. And if you look at the numbers real carefully, you'll see that they tend to be smaller numbers, smaller velocities over here uh, near this bank. You know, they're bigger over here than they are over there, which is OK. That's part of reality. If you look at how they change in the middle, uh, you know, down here it goes from 0.67 to 1.44, 2.6, 3.4, 4.4, and then back down to 1.7. So there's a place out here where the velocity is greatest. And it's, it's not in the middle. It's actually, in this particular case, farther towards this side. Now, let's look at the variation in velocity of this dimension. So let's kind of look uh, right here first. You know, the, right beneath the surface, it's 2.6. You get a little further down, it's 3.1. So it's actually gone up. The water's going faster as we get deeper. And then you go a little bit deeper, and now it's slowing down again. It's down to roughly 2.6, and then it goes down to about 1.9, and then down to 1. And in actuality, when you get right down there next to the street bed, the velocity is essentially zero. There's actually a really thin layer of water right next to the street bed that pretty much is not moving. It's really thin. So you're not going to experience that. The lines here are contour lines that collect, uh, connect uh, equal velocities. So this number here represents the four foot per second velocity. Everything on this side of it is higher than four feet per second. This line represents three feet per second. So everything between this line and that line would be between three and four feet per second. This line is two feet per second and so on. So this is the contour that represents the fastest water. And what I want to point out is it's not near the banks, it's not near the bottom, it's up near the surface. But the fastest place is down here. It's not right there. So the generalization that you'd be tempted to make from this picture is that the water velocity is going to be fastest someplace out here, probably away from the banks, 
And it's not going to be fastest right at the surface. It's going to be fastest just below the surface a little bit. Now let's look at this one. Let me move this down so I can actually point to it. So here, we'll just look at the contours. Here's a five foot per second contour. So the water inside this little loop here, that's going at least five feet per second. Every place else, it's slower. And look, you know, the generalization that I proposed from the last figure works here. You get away from the banks and down beneath the surface a little bit. That's where the fastest water is. And that's true, pretty much true up here too. The biggest velocity is right there. It looks like it's actually a little bit closer to the surface than it does in these two diagrams. But that's the generalization that I want you to take away from this. The fastest velocity from one side to the other, it's probably going to be out here. And when you're in this dimension, it's not going to be right at the surface. It's typically going to be a little bit lower. Now why is that? We don't normally think of water as experiencing friction, but in fact it does. So when the water is really close to the bank over here, or the stream bed down here, it's experiencing friction with the stream bank, so it's going to be slower. The least opportunity for friction is when you're out here, away from the uh, each side, each bank. Um, and then, you know, why we get a faster velocity right below the surface probably has something to do with the surface tension of the water. But I have to admit, I haven't, haven't really looked into that. So I offer this up as actual real-world numbers that support my contention from a few minutes ago that the velocity does vary from one location to another. So the question becomes, how are we going to deal with that? The way we're going to deal with that, we're going to break up this cross-section into a bunch of subsections. And how many subsections? At least 20. But you know, we don't really need to do any more than 30 in order to get a, a good answer for the question, what's the discharge in the stream at this point? So, we're recognizing that the water velocity is going to be different here, than here, than here, than here, than here, and so on. So we'll just bite the bullet and make separate measurements in each of those places. So by breaking up the overall cross-section into subsections, we're really addressing the problem of the water varying in velocity from one side to the other. I'm going to assume that's pretty clear. We still have one other problem. Uh, so maybe in the middle of each of these subsections, some, some place from top to bottom, we'll make our velocity measurement. But where should we make it relative to the water column from the surface down to the stream? Bed? 